Group incentive schemes have risen in popularity uh, as, as organisations have uh, focused attention uh, on the importance of teams and team working. That there has been a, 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 a gradual um, awareness of the, the logicality of attempting to encourage uh, team-based performance in organisations, which seems an increasingly important thing, whilst focusing uh, attention in rewards on individuals. So organisations see uh, the development of, of team-based rewards, of, of team incentives, group incentives, uh, as something which uh, may uh, naturally reflect the kinds of workflow, the kinds of um, cooperative uh, working arrangements uh, that they would like to encourage. And so there's a, a, a congruency, a good fit uh, between, uh, uh, between these kinds uh, of approaches. This is the kind of uh, reward uh, that may encourage the types of behaviour that they increasingly see uh, as being uh, important and useful to them. Now, when we say team, we often imagine uh, a relatively small uh, group and team incentives, group incentives can uh, be focused uh, at that level but the idea of a, of a group incentive uh, might be applied uh, anywhere between or be focused around anything in between that relatively small group right up to the level of uh, the whole uh, organisation. Uh, and so we can think about the different kinds of approaches that we use uh, in terms of how it, uh, it, it reflects uh, the performance of uh, those elements of the organisation, those collective units of the organisation in different ways and how useful those different uh, elements, uh, those different groups within organisations, even if that's the whole organisation itself, how useful uh, those are in terms of directing the attention uh, of uh, individuals uh, within them. So it may well be seen as an important aspect of how we want people to work, that if we want an orientation around a team, around a group, then it seems natural to reward that group for their, for their success, that we, uh, you know, that in very simplistic terms, we want that kind of behaviour, we want successful groups, we want people to work hard and cooperate uh, together, and so we reward them in that way. It may also be that we want people to identify with the whole organisation. But we want that to encourage that kind of unitarist uh, uh, identification uh, of employees with the organisations that, the, that they work for. And so that sharing the success of an organisation, that if the organisation as a whole does well, then everybody should do well, um, is part of that philosophical um, uh, idea uh, that we are all part of this bigger thing, that we all have the same interests, that financially our interests are aligned. It's not us against them, it's uh, all of us together. And if we do well as a, as a, as a company, then we share that uh, uh, throughout uh, the organisation. Now, just as we've seen with some uh, uh, individual approaches towards uh, incentives, uh, there are uh, similar difficulties that we identify uh, in terms of uh, creating that link between what a team or a group does and how we uh, reward them effectively. And that some of those uh, problems are bound up with how we effectively uh, measure the performance uh, of those teams. That um, all of a sudden, because we're dealing not in terms of what have you done, but in terms of what have we done, then the relationship between what have I done and what has my contribution to the team been and what has the team done uh, become uh, problematic. That it raises all kinds of uh, difficult questions because it's not always easy to disentangle what the contribution of various team or group members has been to the overall uh, achievement uh, of the team. Uh, in question. So this becomes, you know, exacerbated the, the, the bigger the team or the bigger the group that you're, that you're thinking about. So 
the biggest teams that we usually look at are the organisation as a whole. And uh, team incentives in this form uh, are things like uh, profit sharing or profit related uh, pay. Now, if you're a relatively small organisation, then you may well be able to, to see, to trace through your, the relationship between what you do on a day-to-day -day basis or over, the, uh, over a, the course of a period of time and the success of an organisation. And if you're relatively senior, that line of sight between your contribution and the outcome of the, the whole group uh, is relatively straightforward. But in a big organisation, particularly if you're you know, fairly low down in the, in the hierarchy, the line of sight gets obscured. It's, n it's not always easy to see what your contribution uh, has been. And that for some people within the group, it becomes really quite difficult that, uh, you know, that if they don't contribute directly to uh, the measures that we use, typically profit or uh, you know, some kind of financial measure of success, then if you're involved in some kind of process activity rather than a revenue raising activity, um, then how is that determined? How is your relationship to that group output uh, determined? How can you see what you do? How does it have the kind of incentivizing or motivational impact uh, that you would want it to have if it's actually going to serve its purpose uh, as a, a, a useful mechanism to encourage certain kinds of behaviors and be strategic uh, in that way. So um, some of the um, innovations that we've seen in this area are to broaden the definition of what success at group level means, particularly at the, these, these bigger organizational level groups. So things like Kaplan and Norton's balanced scorecard model, which allows a clear, a broader view of what organizational success means, allows a, an easier identification of contribution at the individual level to those group uh, outcomes. More generally, the problems associated with um, the relationship between individuals and groups when we start to try and reward people on that basis are bound up with the problems of uh, free riding. Uh, and uh, this issue of free riding, where individual members of a group don't contribute, that some people do so much more than others, and that that becomes an issue once we start rewarding people on, on the basis of group success rather than on individual contribution to that group, uh, this has been an, a, become an, an ongoing issue. Uh, now we know that you know, free riding uh, at a common sense level is a terrible thing and we all hate it uh, uh, and it's incredibly irritating. Um, but there is an argument to say that free riding in the context of generally available rewards for group activity is entirely natural and rational. Manka Olson, uh, economist, uh, famously talks about the rationality of free rider uh, behaviour. Um, and so this becomes a, a, just an ongoing problem uh, that's built into the very basis uh, of the design of these kinds of, pro uh, of approaches. How can we deal with free riders. It's natural that, that some people, given the existence of public goods, that rewards that are available generally within this group, uh, it makes sense for people to kind of hide and do as little as possible and then just enjoy the success of the group uh, as a whole. So how do you overcome that? How do you deal with those kinds uh, of problems if they're not going to undermine the basis of the, uh, of the, of the reward uh, altogether. Now most approaches towards dealing with free riders in this, this kind of uh, situation uh, has been focused around uh, the idea that, uh, that groups should or, or will naturally attempt to police themselves because we're all irritated by free riders in this kind of situation. Uh, the, the more that we can strengthen group norms, group values that, that discourage uh, this kind of free riding uh, activity, uh, then, uh, then that's an, an appropriate uh, way to, to deal with it, that we, uh, we both strengthen those group norms, that, that identification of the group and that we're all responsible to the group, and then effectively allow the group to police itself. 
so that uh, free riders are, are rooted out by colleagues. It's not a management activity. It becomes a function of uh, group, uh, group behaviour. Uh, we can also you know, attempt to, to develop you know, maybe more sophisticated performance measures that can discourage free riding as well. But generally, it's a normative approach. This idea that uh, groups can police themselves and that they can ferret out free riders uh, and deal with that problem uh, in, in itself. Now, uh, another way that organisations have um, dealt with the, the line of sight problem, this idea that if we're too far away from uh, the outcome, that generates the reward, then the, 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 the kind of motivational impact gets diluted uh, or lost, are, um, are gain-sharing uh, approaches. Uh, you know, this is a, 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 a largely American uh, innovation. Uh, in, in the UK, we've generally seen them as, as kind of you know, productivity deals, uh, where um, there is a, a that the, that the measure of group success um, at the level of the organisation, isn't based upon some broad measure like profit or whatever, uh, but they're more finely uh, drawn uh, so that um, they can be associated with the, uh, the impact of uh, employees rather than the, the kind of wider set of variables that affect things like profit. You know, because profit is, uh, you know, affected by the things that are out of employee control, like things that happen in the supply chain, uh, about the cost of raw materials, about currency fluctuations, about uh, import-export tariffs, all of these kinds of, of things that are just outside of what employees are capable of, uh, of having any influence uh, over. Uh, and so if you take those things as a, as a, as a measure of success uh, and all of the other variables act against that you can be working as hard as you like, and the outcome is still no good, and so you, there, there's no uh, reward to be uh, shared. With gain sharing, um, the measures of success uh, strip away all of those extraneous variables. They just focus in on the kinds of things that employees have some control over. Uh, it's no surprise, given that, that um, these uh, types of rewards are often associated with um, uh, the presence of unions uh, and that uh, some of these uh, plans uh, were the brainchild uh, of, uh, of union uh, negotiators. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Scanlon plan, uh, which is a form of, uh, of gain sharing, um, the, the measure of the gain is, uh, is a productivity uh, uh, gain effectively. It's about the reduction in payroll costs against uh, net sales. So the more revenue that's, uh, that, that's produced versus the payroll, so how much more productive each member of uh, staff has become, that, that becomes the measure uh, of, uh, of the gain. The Impreshare plan works in a similar way, but it's uh, based around uh, the ratio of, uh, of working hours against uh, output. Uh, the Rooker plan uh, looks at reduction in payroll costs against uh, uh, value added. And more recently, we've seen more sophisticated multi-factor uh, models, which attempt to incorporate um, more sophisticated, qualitative uh, measures of gain, like customer satisfaction, quality standards, uh, and so on. So that these are, are seen as quite sophisticated and flexible uh, approaches uh, towards uh, group incentives uh, that, um, uh, that, that have some, uh, uh, some uh, prospects for, uh, for success. And not only is the, the, the actual design of the, the scheme important, but the fact that these are often based around um, or based upon uh, extensive uh, organisational uh, cooperation with unions and through them with the workforce, that they have, or they seem to have a degree of uh, you know, stability and strength to them that is based around that, that, uh, those employment relations uh, processes. Um, final uh, a, a approach towards uh, group incentive plans or, or, or longer term incentive plans. Now we mentioned profit sharing, uh, but another approach that we see organisations make use of are share ownership uh, schemes. Uh, now these are um, 
as their name suggests, they're longer term uh, incentive plans. They're not, uh, let's look at, let's take a snapshot of what's happened this year or the next year or whatever, and then they'll apply a bonus of some kind. Uh, but they're designed to uh, develop a kind of longer term orientation towards uh, the organisation uh, by um, extending ownership rights uh, to the workforce uh, uh, as part and parcel of that, in, 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 in many ways mirroring the approach of executive share, uh, share option uh, schemes. And the idea is that it's, it provides the basis of uh, non-zero sum game outcomes. Uh, in, in, in rewards, that uh, as the organisation uh, becomes more, uh, more valuable, uh, that some of that value through share ownership can be passed on to employees, so that employees are able to enrich themselves without that uh, resulting in a, a direct transfer of organisational resources from the organisation to the workforce. Now, of course, there is some dilution of share ownership, uh, as part of that, but the uh, the benefits of that, the development of, a, of an ownership culture, that we're all in this together, that we that that, that generates greater willingness to, to work beyond contract, a greater commitment, greater engagement, greater sense of this is my thing, our thing, not your thing, uh, is seen as a as an important uh, uh, a benefit, uh, generation of uh, commitment. Uh, the ability to recruit scarce staff sometimes when maybe we're not able to um, be as generous in other reward elements. These things are, are very important. Retention, uh, um, uh, longevity of, uh, of service, pay flexibility, strong, important organisational benefits uh, from these kinds uh, of long-term incentive plans.